Uh, thank everyone for joining us. And today, again, the topic is about ways to reduce risk. And we basically put down 10 ways, not necessarily an exhaustive list and not necessarily in the order of, of importance. But these are 10 ways. Uh, what we are finding is that whenever we speak with our clients, we did a recent survey, and the things that worried people the most uh, primarily had to do with security. We can't turn on the news, we can't pick up a paper uh, without seeing in some way that um, security is, um, you know, people are hacking our systems and they're stealing our data and the threats are internal. You know, a, a stat I'll throw out there is that 59% of, of um, people before they're fired or quit, they steal uh, proprietary company information. So, you know, there's real threats and there's, um, they're, they're prevalent and they're always around us. So what I wanted to do is just really raise awareness so that we can, you know, keep our eye on the ball. Uh, one other stat is that uh, IBM did a study recently and they found that 95% of breaches that have occurred within the last two years have been people-related. And what I'm saying there is that they are um, not uh, hacking systems per se. They're not brute forcing trying to overtake your password, uh, overtake your router, or things of that nature. They're using what I call social engineering. They're trying to send you an email and get you to click on something. They're trying to drop a USB key in the parking lot and get you to plug it into their machine. They're trying to hack your uh, social media account so that they can begin to gather more information about you and use your identity. So these are you know socially um, driven ways that they can acquire information from us and then use it against us or breach our systems and steal the data that we have within our systems. So of course this is hosted by BIS and a lot of you guys on here know me. Uh, basically um, you know, started about 17 years ago and have, you know, currently grown the, the companies and really we're going pretty much under the BIS technology group now, business made easy. And that's what we want to do. We want to help companies become more effective, more, um, you know, provide more information so that people can use technology more effectively. <clears throat> so how do we reduce the risk that are, uh, I believe this is not going away anytime soon for sure. This is going to be something that we're going to deal with for a long period of time. I don't see the end in sight. So how do we deal with this? And the way I like to approach things is from a standpoint of you will be hacked. It is not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And I think if you think that way, um, It'll help us set us up, set ourselves up for success, and uh, in a lot of different ways. And uh, we'll talk about that a little later on on some of the the, the points. But the main thing is, is we want to approach life as if we will, you know, get hacked. I always say, you know, plan, hope for the best, but plan for the worst. And kind of as we go through this presentation, I think you'll see what I'm talking about. There's no such thing as 100% security. You know, if uh, Lehman, um, you know, Lehman Brothers and Goldman Sachs and uh, the NSA and all these large corporations can get hacked, the reality is is that we could get hacked. So we want to understand that the networking and, and the sharing of data by its very nature networks are made to share information they're not made to secure information so we're trying to do something that is inherently against the you know an immutable law or you know the intention of the internet was to share so we're having to put these parameters in place that can help protect us so here's what we want to do really is we want to uh, define what risks are and then we want to put measures in place to minimize that damage and if something were to happen um, we want to be able to recover quickly 
from a breach or from you know a ransomware attack or something that happens bad to us, we want to uh, be able to recover quickly. The number one thing that we have here is you want a good backup solution. And your backup solution that you're wanting to put in place needs to incorporate um, a couple of factors. We have some fancy terms for them, but one of them is recovery time objective. And that means, okay, I have a backup and I have my pertinent data, but I don't have a computer that will run that data. So that's a big problem because you know, say you have to get another computer and you got to order it, you know, you could have a three to four down, day downtime depending upon what time of day that happened. And of course, you know, then do you have all of your media? So the questions you want to ask yourself is how long can I be without this data? And I have clients tell me all the time, well, I can be without it for a week as long as it doesn't happen on Thursday because i got to submit payroll. So, you know, you want to have that um, kind of into the mix. You know, you 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 got to have it where, because we know Murphy's Law says that the, uh, the breach will happen on Thursday. Another term is recovery time. Let's say you're backing up at night. Well, that means that if you had something happen to you at the end of business, you would lose a full day's worth of business to go back and restore that. So you really want to ask those two questions. How far back do I go before I'm, I'm into good, solid data? And then how long can I be without that data? And there's, there's good news is there's a lot of very cost-effective ways to, uh, to have a backup that happens often, and it also is a complete backup, not just the actual data, but the applications and the system completely with another server sitting there ready to be started so that if you had an incredibly bad event happen, you could actually start up on another machine in the time it takes basically to boot that machine. And if the entire site was wiped out, that whole image could be started up within four hours in the cloud with you connected to it. So there are some, we, call, we kind of class that as business continuity. And because of the cost point has come so far down, more and more people can afford that. And um, really, I think the standard um, for uptime or really the, the tolerance for downtime, because everybody's systems are set up to where they can't do without this data is really kind of pushed everything into more of a business continuity, not so much a backup, but I need to continue business in the bad event. So that's, that's one. Second, and I see this all the time, is you need a good security policy. I recently worked for a group that uh, was a distributor of, um, of wholesale foods to restaurants, and they really, they didn't have the proper policies to match what they were saying. And they were concerned, of course, about their proprietary pricing and routing of how they routed their trucks. Very sensitive data, and they didn't have a policy put in place to keep, let's say, their salespeople um, from being able to have access to that data and share that, you know, to send an email at home and things of that nature. And what I always say is that the people who do have policies, most people have verbal policies. And they often, I hear statements like, and if I ever caught them doing X, well, they're fired. And, you know, we have tools where we can go in and see where people are, are uh, going on the Internet, let's say. And when I go back and show them the report, they're appalled. And what I always say is that you need to have a written policy. It doesn't have to be that fancy. It just needs to incorporate what you're saying and then you need to have your employees sign it. And then the next step is to have the, the firewalls or the, the cloud-based filtering meet those standards so that the people are not able to do those things. Most people have these devices in-house, but they're just not implementing them. So I have a verbal policy, and then they won't have the measures in place to block it. And then you get a paper policy 
that's agreed upon and understood and signed, and then you need to have that uh, policy um, uh, enforced by the tools or the, the filtering that you have at your office. And again, if you guys have questions and you know, type them in the box there in the uh, comment box. And Christy, if you feel it's pertinent or relative that you stop me, please don't hesitate, and I'll deal with things along the way. Or if not, we'll just deal with questions at the end here. Okay, we'll do. Also, another thing, and I'm, I'm gonna try not to kill you guys. I'm gonna try to with PowerPoint and conversation, you know, with just me speaking. I'm gonna stop here. Um, we'll get through these, and then I really want some good questions because that's where the rubber meets the road, and we can have some real-life scenarios that we can discuss. Another one is really just layers of protection. This is kind of how we set up our network, and I don't want to go through every layer right now, but you can't have a single layer of protection. I'll use antivirus, desktop antivirus, and think that that is going to secure you in today's environment. You know, you need to, uh, you know, be filtering your email. You need to have maybe a, you know, a firewall with filters. And I like setting them up with different vendors. For instance, if you're going to use, say, Trend Micro on the desktop for your antivirus, you want to use, we use like Barracuda for email filtering, and we use SonicWall for firewall filtering because every company has a philosophy of how they block threat. And if you mix and match them and you filter the traffic, you're going to have a lot higher uh, probability of getting caught, you know, getting the bad, the, bad, um, the bad guy caught in one of those filters because they all update at various times. And we could really have a, a whole conversation around zero-day threats and, and all these kind of things. But you really want a layered approach and I'd be happy to talk with anyone uh, more one-on-one -on -one about that. Uh, one of the easiest things you can do is put in um, smart password policy, where you're changing your passwords often, where they're complex, um, meaning I would say like you know seven or eight characters with a capital letter, a number, and a special character. That's something that you know, they have tools, the bad guys have tools that we call them grinder tools. And they'll just throw passwords to, at a, uh, throw uh, login attempts at a machine, and it will continue to grind away until they, can, until they can do it. Now, if they ever get access, and they have, and there's a short password, and they call that hash, the passwords are secured at a level, not a great level, on a machine, like say a server, but they can reverse that hash on a short password with four characters in probably 20 minutes. So if you've got short passwords and they're not complex, they have tools that can reverse that password very, very, very quickly. And we're seeing a high margin of, um, of accounts getting hacked where they're basically because the passwords are just very poor and if you if you've had your password a really long time um you know a lot of you know years ago you could get by with a four a four uh character password and you know it's pretty pretty good that is not the case so you need to be changing your passwords they need to have seven or eight characters with a cap and a special character and a number you need to have your system set up to where if somebody tries to log in seven or eight times with the wrong password, that it locks the account. That alone is a huge measure because if you don't know your password in seven or eight times, you're not going to know it in 70 or 80 times. So it's really not going to affect you, but the bad guys that are throwing these passwords at a, at a device after seven or eight times, which, you know, they can throw seven or eight passwords in a couple of seconds. It'll lock them out for 30 minutes. Well, they're not going to get very far down the road if basically that would mean that for a 30-minute lockout, they get seven tries. Well, every seven, you know, they're only going to be able to try um, 12 times seven, 96, or is that, excuse me, 84 passwords uh, at that machine. And really, they're going to quit trying because, 
they're not going to, you know, they're not going to be successful. So just changing the password. One other note on passwords. I think statistically I read a stat the other day that 60% of passwords are the same across multiple platforms. And what I'm saying is I'll I'll say it like this. You are more than likely using a single password in your Facebook, in your Netflix, uh, on your bank account. And really you need to have uh, different passwords because if the bad guy, this, this is the game they play. They want to hack one system because they know that there's a 60% chance that you're using that password in other areas of your life. If they can get your email and they can start reading your emails and, and, and get to where they can receive and get password resets via email and you know, all these things, they can begin to see what services in the world that you use and then they can start hacking them and stealing data from you. That's really how it happens. There's some tools. <clears throat> I like LastPass, L-A-S-T-P-A-S-S -S -S is a is a tool that you can use that will help you because it's hard to remember all those passwords. Uh, also, you know, like Apple, the Apple Keychain is a secure way of storing it. Um, you know, storing uh, passwords so you don't have to remember them. But change your password. Also, um, mobile device security. Uh, if you look at the at a graph, and if you were to see the things that are happening on mobile devices, you'd be amazed. Uh, so much so that the television manufacturers, like the Sony's and the Samsungs and the uh, Vizios, they're worried because this new generation, they don't want a 75-inch curved screen Super HD TV. They're very happy with just doing all the things they do on their phone, and there is a ton of things happening, and more times than not, I see people with not even an antivirus on their phone. And if you look statistically, there is a large, they call them honeypots, where they will just capture keystrokes and logins and passwords and things off of a mobile device. Because, I mean, again, you're browsing the Internet, you're, you're, you're doing your banking, you're checking your email. I mean, there's just a million things that you're doing on a mobile device now with zero protection, you know, extra protection. And it's just really dangerous. You need to get at least some antivirus, if not even some encryption, on your mobile devices. If you look at HIPAA, the largest way that data is breached, or the largest breaches that happen, in a, most common are with mobile devices, USB keys, uh, you know, laptops being stolen, uh, mobile, you know, cell phones being stolen, and a lot of data is lost. You got to think we use these things for everything now. So a good mobile device security uh, policy is is essential. Also, another thing is is more in the physical realm. But on-site security, having the um, having a camera up that's monitoring your doors, monitoring we call it ingress and egress, is essential for good security. Uh, I, I sat in on a thing at the Mobile Chamber the other day, and they had a guy from the uh, Mobile PD, and they have a a um, a program in Mobile, and it's something Shield. I forget the exact name of it. But if you have a business in Mobile and you have security cameras, you can actually uh, call the Mobile Police Department, and they will uh, put a secure link into your security camera so that if you made a call from your um, business, they could actually look in real time as to what is going on so that they can inform the officer before they get there. Or maybe they, they know your location and they've made a relationship with your neighbor and the, the neighbor has an outdoor camera, they can actually log into that camera and view uh, what was going on, which I thought was extremely, um, this is extremely innovative because they're able to do this at, I mean, at a very large scale because most cameras interfaces are they can securely access it there there's a standard platform out there now so they can access literally and I forgot the number but it was incredible he had come from New York and they had 
physically put in just Times Square, I think 3,800 cameras in and around Times Square that the that the uh, New York Police Department uh, had put in, and it didn't cover everything. And they have done this, and I forget, I think they were upwards of over that number in Mobile already, and they can see where they could have over 10,000 camera systems that they would be able to log into. Um, so, again, I'll stop there, but on-site security is, is really something that is very vital uh, for overall security. Also, um, an encrypted file um, sync solution. More and more people are using, you know, what we call BYOD, bring your own device. And there's another term I want to throw in here called shadow IT, where basically that's just where somebody is using, um, they're getting their own technology because you're not providing it. And I'll use Dropbox as an example. Let's say that they need to get files that are, uh, that are um, too large or they need to have access to those files when they're out of the office. Well, what they'll do is they'll just load, get a Dropbox account and they'll put Dropbox on their phone so they have access to all of those files on their phone. Well, that's good, innovative, you might say, for the uh, employee, but now we have company documents scattered into personal accounts. I always use this way, you know, it would be like you allowing someone to come in and say, hey, I don't want to take these files in the filing cabinet in the accounting office. I just want to make copies of them, and I'm going to store them at my place. And then if I get hit by a bus, we've got no way to retrieve these files. I see it all the time. And, um, you know, it's just it's just letting files get out in the wild, and then once that data is out there, you know, it can never really be put back in the, uh, in the, in the box. So an encrypted file solution is, is essential in today's environment because more and more people, they work from home, they, you know, have mobile devices, and some features that are within these products that are really neat is that in the event, say you had an employee, and they no longer work there, you can do a remote wipe. Or say you lost a laptop or you lost a cell phone, you can do a remote wipe that will remove all of that data from that device as well as all of the files are uh, logged so that whoever touches them, creates them, deletes them, whatever is logged in the background so that if you had someone trying to steal a bunch of data from you, you would see, okay, they've taken all these files and they've emailed them to themselves. You know, they've moved all these files or, or they've copied all these files. And then you can have a log to go back so that you can see what's happening with your files. Another is, you know, uh, proper onboarding and offboarding for employees. We see this all the time with, you know, a new employee comes on and, you know, just knowing what tools they need. Okay, they're going to need an email account. They're going to need a, a file sync account to share data. They're going to have a login to the uh, domain. They're going to have a login to the accounting package. They're going to have a login to the CRM tool. They're going to have, you know, a login to, you know, all of these things. All of that needs to be documented so that whenever they're no longer with the company, whether they're terminated or they leave or whatever, you can go and undo all of that. Uh, because what happens, and I see it all the time, is that in, like, say where you log into the computer, that's called Active Directory. There is a number, I mean, you'll look back and you'll see, oh, yeah, the Sally, yes, yeah, she worked here four years ago. Well, and I'll throw in a wireless to change that wireless encryption key because the reality is is that Sally could be in the parking lot on your wireless logging into your system. And, I mean, that's not far-fetched at all. That is real deal. It happens. Um, you know, so you want to have these this policy so that you don't have to um, – you don't have to, oh, I forgot about that one. You need to take 15 minutes and get it all listed and get somebody to, you know, that actually does it maybe 
to to watch that and um, you know make it um, so that they can um, can get it all documented and then you basically whatever you do on the onboarding you undo on the offboarding that's really big um, here's one that uh, I do a lot of these risk assessments in the um, in the healthcare industry and I've also done them for the American land title like for title companies and attorneys that do that as well as now like um, if you have State Farm as an insurance provider uh, if, if the attorneys that represent them in cases now have to do this risk assessment and you know some of you guys know me well and you know I'm not a big regulatory kind of guy I think a lot of regs are are hooey and I think there are just ways to clog up the system and, and and they make business difficult in this case I really believe in this because uh, on several factors just kind of like top line what you're doing is you're doing an assessment to know where your risk is and then you're basically putting together documentation that shows you where your risk is and it classifies your risk in high medium low and um, so that you know and it creates a workbook so that you can concentrate your efforts I see this all the time I've been involved in this where we've gone out and spent a ton of money on risk assessment I mean excuse me on penetration tests for firewalls and all this kind of stuff when really that isn't this clients biggest risk they're spending money in areas that are really disjointed from the highest level of risk so this the risk assessments they're all based off of the National Institute of Standards and Technology whether it's FINRA you know in the uh, banking industry whether it's HIPAA in the medical whether it's Alta for the American land title uh, or whether it's the things that we're doing for attorneys they're really all based off of a NIST assessment and it's really a good thing I'm a fan of it because I think it it um, it will put you into a position of spending your your dollars wisely and the way we do it I think is is makes a lot of sense there's what I call four pillars to a um, to a risk assessment the first pillar is your governance and there's about 19 documents that you need to have a disaster recovery a uh, higher fire policy a uh, a sanction policy what do you do if you catch someone breaching data you know that's real open and uh, you know you need to have that defined and again this this assessment comes with all these documents there's about 19 of them then the, that's one pillar I call that the government or the documentation and then the second pillar is a physical walkthrough how are you handling I mean, we, you know, we are uh, privy to a lot of information. I'm privy to a lot of offices, and I go into places. And you know, are you keeping your clients' private information secure? I use this one a lot because I was amazed. I went into a medical practice. Basically, when you walked in the door, straight across the hall, when you went in the building, you walked. There was the that was the filing room. And you had to turn right and go down a little hall and then turn left and it opened up into the uh, the lobby and the, you know the, the counter there to sign in well right across the hall when you walked in was the filing room and there was literally thousands of files in that room I would never use that practice because I mean I, I could have walked in there and hauled out as big a load of, of documents as I could have of course we know medical records are so very valuable because they're they're usually current because most people go to the doctor at least once a year and there's just a thousand ways to fraud because of the the the, the depth of the uh, information you can file tax claims you can uh, you can do a, a whole lot of things with that so that's pillar number two is the physical and then pillar three is the um, is the uh, the technical technology wise you know, looking at things from are you patching your systems do you have proper firewalls in place do you have encryption on mobile devices and and the like things like that are you sending uh, emails securely and then the fourth pillar 
is um, has to do with uh, training. Uh, again, our people are our biggest risk, and there's almost no uh, continuing education or ongoing education for our people to keep them up to date on the what is a phishing attack and and uh, all of those type things. And then, of course, finally, we get to employee training, where we're training our people in order to raise their awareness of. Uh, you know, of what is a phishing attack? How should I be managing my password? I don't know how many offices I go in and I see the password is on a sticky note on the bottom of the monitor. You know, that's really not cool whenever you think about if you have clients. I mean, would you want, if you were going to the doctor, would you want your medical records to, to be housed by somebody with a sticky note on the bottom of the uh, monitor with the administrator password? I don't think so. I think if we kind of look at uh, security and if we personalize it, it's a good way to look at it. And, you know, we want everybody taking care of, of, of people's data. And so, all right. Um, I guess we'll open this up uh, for questions. We've got an offer here. We're going to give you guys some, some free stuff, but I guess I'll open it up for questions now, and then we'll talk. Any questions, Christy? We had a few come in. Um, one of the questions was, how can I stop an employee from stealing my data? Okay. That's a really great question. Um, and again, like I mentioned earlier, statistically 59%, 6 to 10 people steal something that's proprietary before they quit or get fired. So here's a couple things. Um, one is to block your USB ports on the computers. You know, how simple would it be to walk in with a USB stick or a whatever, you know, people call them different things, but basically a jump drive, stick it in a machine, copy a bunch of files out, pull that out, and walk out. That's one thing is, you know, and it's really easy to do is to block the ports. And you can even do it at different levels. You can say, all right, I can, I'll block them. Um, you know, I'll make it to where they can, they can read files from their jump drive, but they can't copy files to it. So there's varying levels. That's one way. Another way is to uh, block webmail from your uh, users. You know, if they need to check their Gmail account or their Yahoo account, let them check that on their phone. Yeah. You know, don't let them have access to their own files. Um, one other way is to block, like, Dropbox and Google Drive and OneDrive and all these proprietary ways that people could log into Dropbox, drag a thousand files over into Dropbox, their Dropbox account, and sync up and then close the browser and a thousand of your files are out there. Those are a couple ways that would be, uh, would be you know, very practical ways that are easy to implement that um, can happen and in, in help. Okay, we just had one come in through chat. How do we get antivirus on mobile devices? Um, depending upon which service they have, um, there is most mainline um, antivirus providers have a mobile uh, a mobile device uh, protection. And if it's well, the, we use, we simply email or text a uh, a link that you click, and basically you know next next next, and you're protected. So it's just like you would install on a computer per se, you can uh, you can also install uh, security on mobile devices in the same manner. And so, not not a difficult task, and it's not like you got to plug it in and do a bunch of things. It's it's all done through the app store or through the web browser, kind of like a computer. Okay. Um, we have another that came in through email. Um, is there some kind of filtering that will block those phishing emails you were talking about? 
Yeah, that's a great question. And statistically, your your biggest threat is your email. And I mentioned earlier about blocking webmail because I always say it this way: if I'm in a room and I am uh, trying to secure a room, well, the fewer doors and windows in that room, the more likely I'm going to be able to be I'm, I'm going to have a better chance of securing it. So what we recommend is block all web mail. And it doesn't mean that a Gmail account can't send you mail or anything like that. It's simply that you can't go to Yahoo's mail on a web browser on a computer and have access to it. That's one way. And another way, in the, on the one account, the corporate account that you do use, we use a product called Barracuda uh, ATP. Uh, advanced threat protection and I'm a huge fan if anybody I'm always uh, trying to get people to go to this product because we've seen such great success because what they do is they filter the mail in the cloud before it ever comes and hits the server and if you're hosting your own server uh, for mail it reduces the load on your server tremendously because about 90 percent of all email is spam so you know, whenever you get some spam, uh, now you know some some people do a really poor job of, of filtering spam. But if you get one or two true spam a day, that means you haven't signed up for something. You know, you're not doing bad because there's an enormous amount of spam. But with this Barracuda Advanced Threat Protection, what they're doing is they're actually not only checking it for origin. You know, where is it coming from? Uh, is this a known place? Is this they have a lot of this already registered? Where, uh, for instance, they know where Google sends mail from. They have the IPs. If it's coming from a place spoofing as Google, they know it ain't Google. Same way with most of our mainline mail servers. But they also check every link. They basically click every link and they verify that that link is benign. That there is nothing malicious behind the link. That's the magic, really, is that the links are checked to make sure that they don't go to a bad site. We've been using that for probably probably over a year now, a year and a half that's been out. And we were one of the first um, the folks, actually, we tried it in beta on our own account. And uh, it really is the most effective way uh, is that type of service that is actually clicking the links. As long as it block and spam, but it's actually clicking the links. Okay, we had two questions come in from chat. Could you provide a sample security policy for the people on the call today? Yeah, absolutely. I will do that. If they will email me or email you uh, with the request, I'll be happy to give them a, this is a boilerplate, you know, kind of a template. But, you know, if you spent 30 minutes with it, 60 minutes with it, you could have a document that would be suited to your environment. Okay, we had another question come in. Where is a safe place to keep passwords? Um, you know, I talked about LastPass. There's a ton of services out there, a ton, a ton, a ton of services that uh, RoboForm is another one. Uh, and what they are is they are tools that are like add-ins that go in your browser and whenever you come to a site they're stored there. I use a Mac and Mac has a thing called iChain, a keychain I think it's called and these passwords are encrypted and so whenever you come to a website it remembers and you type in the username and it remembers your password. Now there's not a great, I mean, because the downside to that is, is well, if I ever got access to the to the keychain, well, then I got everything. I got the mother load. So, you know, there's not there's not a cookie cutter. Here's the thing you do. Um, the real and and to do it right, you really need to have every account needs to have a unique password, so that someone can't hack your. Netflix account and then go into your Facebook and then go into your email and so on and so forth. You got to have different ones. So I think that is because of the way it's stored, they are encrypting those um, with 256-bit encryption, very strong encryption. I think 
a last pass or a robo form or a keychain or something of those sorts is probably better. But the other thing that is important is to change them every few months because that will keep you where even if it were to be breached, they don't they can't collect because we think these guys are like, you know, one hit wonders and sometimes they are, but they have gotten to where they they're social engineers. They get something and they continue to work it and they try it in other places. And again, if you change your password, now they can no longer work that channel that they've hacked into. There's tons of incidents that have happened. I like to use the target because they basically, that, that took years <clears throat> to pull off that target breach because they had to hack the account through the air conditioning company and then they had to uh, elevate their rights into into target and then they had to um, then they began to just mine data and collect data so the bad guys are not one hit wonders they are absolutely diligent people uh, so to sum all that up if you're going to use something use LastPass or or RoboForm or Keychain if you run a Mac uh, but then still change your passwords often Okay, we've got um, one last question. Um, if I were um, hit by ransomware, how long would my company be down if I've implemented everything you've discussed today? Um, you know, we have every case is a little bit unique, but you know, kind of going back to the backup thing that we started with, um, if you were to be hit with ransomware, we could actually we would start up that secondary server with the image that could be as be as, as short as an hour to old, and we could have you back up in literally 15 minutes. And uh, I mean, that's on the outside, as long as it takes to boot the server. And um, you know, that is would be one big way to um, you know to secure you would be with something like that. So as short as 15 minutes, um, very 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 quickly. Okay, I think that's all the questions we had. Um, if anyone else has any more, you can always submit them. You know, send them to Phillip's email, plong at sbis.com, or to my email, cthompson at sbis.com, and we'll get those answered for you. Philip? Yeah, let me finish up. Here's some things that we think that you need to do. First is you want to perform some form of risk assessment, whether it's an official risk assessment like I discussed, or whether it's an internal one, or if you you know, you want to converse with me and, and we'll put some quasi something together. But at the end of the day, it's good business to know where your risk is. I'm sure everybody's familiar with a, a SWOT analysis, strength, weakness, opportunities, threats. Well, in a way, you're doing this with your data and with your network. You're taking an honest look at what could happen, where are you strong, where are you weak, and then that way, whenever you move forward, you spend your money wisely. Again, I, I talked about doing some penetration testing. Very difficult, very time consuming, very expensive. And I've had companies insist that we do that when the reality is is that their money would have been way spent better whenever you look at probability of risk and if you weigh out risk. So you need to perform some form of a risk assessment, whether it's formal or whether it's informal. You need to know where your risk is and and be honest and sober you know, not the head buried in the sand, but be honest with it. Um, then create some form of security plan. And, um, you know, where are my biggest risks? Uh, how am I going to mitigate that risk? And, you know, put some sort of a plan together. The higher fire policy is huge, 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 because um, that is where a lot of things go, go wrong. It's because people... They hire them in and sign them up, and when they fire them, they don't delete all their credentials and their accounts, and they leave themselves very, very, very vulnerable. Uh, and then train your employees. That is your biggest risk. Your employees, they're not hacking systems. They're hacking people. Train your employees with some form of, uh, of, of training to let them know how they need to manage. What we recommend is... Um, 
if you guys buy a month, we have a, a monthly service where we do um, phishing or simulated phishing email attacks. And it also comes with weekly um, micro security training. And with that, you're going to get, they're going to get a monthly email that's a simulated phishing attack. And what happens is that, and we, with this, we're going to give away free training as well. What happens is whenever they get whatever type of a phishing attack it was, if it's a password attack, trying to get passwords, if they do get hacked, they uh, they will click on it and it will automatically say you've been hooked, and it takes them to the training section based on what type of phishing attack it was. And then also there's a monthly newsletter that comes out with a security newsletter that we send out, as well as a um, a weekly micro training about security. Security awareness takes repetitive reminding, reminding, reminding. If you send those phishing email attacks, people will get they'll get hooked. And I've had a pretty good success rate. I'm hooking 21% of the people. With and it's not coming from me. It's not like they they think oh it's coming from Philip Long. This is just this is coming from various sources. And 21 percent of the time we have people click on the email that's phishing. So it's this is this is how everybody's getting ransomware. I mean this is prevalent in the market. But you get it where you're sending that out once a month. They'll become a security awareness will automatically happen within the company because nobody wants to get on the report that shows they got phished. So they, um, they, they begin to think that extra second before they click on that. So basically with this, we do free security training classes with an admin report. We do, it has some free interactive quizzes, free training certifications, as well as free ongoing uh, security tips and reminders from the entire company. That's basically a $999 value for free. And so it's it's really your biggest risk is your people, and you want to spend some time educating them. And you can't do it all at once. You have to do it in these little two and three minute videos and a and a phishing attack to keep them always on their toes to think before they click. So that's the deal. And if you guys are interested in talking about that, you can send me an email. I'll be happy to uh, to discuss it in further detail. But I think that, um, you know, again, security is our biggest uh, threat to our business right now. We want to take it seriously, and we're providing some, some very cost-effective ways uh, to get that done. So any, if there's no more questions or anything, uh, we'll end this. And, again, we're always available here for you guys. If you have any questions, just let us know.